Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny McGregor, and I'm the CEO of AsiaLink, and it's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to this In Conversation, the inside track to a career in diplomacy with a perspective from the wonderful Sue Boyd. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance here today. We actually have a great group of people here today, um, over 130 people from all over Australia, including people from foreign affairs, from the corporate world, and uh, a number of students as well. So you're all very welcome. And we would encourage you uh, to, to post your questions in the chat room so that we can make this a very lively interactive conversation and discussion. This is an absolutely fascinating afternoon. We have an AsiaLink in conversation on the inside track to a career in diplomacy, a perspective from Sue Boyd. In 1989, Sue was one of only four female Australian ambassadors in the world. She paved the way and we now have 43% of Australian heads of mission women. She was the first woman to head missions in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Hong Kong and Fiji. And she's acknowledged as a trailblazer in the field of international diplomacy. And now fortunately for all of us interested in foreign affairs, Sue has written her memoir, Not Always Diplomatic, An Australian Woman's Journey Through International Affairs. Today, we're also very privileged to have our um, facilitator, Michael Wesley, and he will be um, in, uh, talking with Sue and uh, they're, they're very well established old colleagues. So it's gonna be very lively. If I can just first introduce Sue just very briefly, cause I don't wanna cut into the, uh, the conversation today. Sue was born in India and educated in 13 schools in five different languages, learning several languages along the way sorry, in different, five different countries. In 1964, she volunteered for a year teaching in Africa. And in 1966, she and her family migrated to Western Australia. At the University of WA, she completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and politics and a graduate diploma in education while working part-time as a journalist at the Perth Daily News. She was the first woman elected president of the Guild of Undergraduates and was later awarded an honorary doctorate by UWA. In 1970, she joined the Department of External Affairs in Canberra. And as I said earlier, played a pioneering and ongoing role in improving the status of women. That 34 year career in the Australian Foreign Service included head of Australian diplomatic missions in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Hong Kong and Fiji. And she worked in other roles in Portugal, East Germany, the UN, in New York, and in DFAT offices in Canberra and Sydney. And since retiring from the Foreign Service and settling in Perth, Sue has worked with the Argyle Diamond Mine and the Mirawang and Gidjoo communities in the East Kimberley. And she's also served on commercial, not-for-profit and education boards. She mentors other women and students. She's lectured at UWA and Murdoch, and she rejuvenated the Australian Institute of International Affairs in WA, and now works as a senior executive business coach. It's wonderful to have you, Sue. Michael Wesley is Deputy Vice-Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne, and I'm pleased to say that AsiaLink sits within his portfolio. Michael Wesley has extensive experience in international relations and has worked in higher ed, government and the private sector. Previously, Michael was Professor of International Affairs and Dean at the College of Asia and the Pacific at the ANU. He was Director of the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at ANU, Executive Director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy, 
Director of the Griffith Asia Institute and Assistant Director, Director General for Transnational Issues at the Office of National Assess Assessments. Michael's published widely on foreign policy, Asia's international relations and strategic affairs and the politics of state building interventions. Michael has also reviewed an Australian woman's journey through international affairs for the Lowy interpreter under the heading, Her Brilliant Career. Michael suggests it's a must read for women and men and proposes a sequel. So I know we're in for a lively and robust discussion today. Over to you, Michael, to take us through this conversation. Jenny, thank you so much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be taking part in this wonderful event, which was, I, I say sadly, uh, initially planned as an in-person event. Um, but uh, unfortunately, COVID has come up with us and uh, we're doing it online. Uh, and I must say, it, uh, it, it, it may be a blessing because it, it may mean that we are able to reach a much greater audience than we might have been able to do uh, face to face. So welcome, wonderful to see you again. Um, I, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've known Sue for probably close to 25 years um, and have always enjoyed uh, catching up with Sue. Uh, Sue, can I also thank you for uh, a wonderfully entertaining and really important book. Uh, I can commend it incredibly highly uh, to all of our audience members because it is a it, it is a very entertaining read and a really important book in terms of its messages. So let me begin um, by, uh, because I know uh, that we have uh, a large number of people with us today, many of whom are likely to be students and uh, many of whom are, are likely to be contemplating a diplomatic career of their own. And I'm sure the question that many would like uh, you to answer is what was it that led you towards diplomacy as a, choosing diplomacy as a career? And what, are, what were um, the early life lessons uh, that you learned uh, along the way uh, that you found most useful as uh, a, a career diplomat? Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's very nice to be here. I'm sorry also that I'm not, I'm not here in in, in, per, in person that uh, this is uh, on Zoom. Um, but as you say, that's also has its, has its benefits. Um, well, what it, I, 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 read, I started to write this book really particularly um, for, for the students that I was working with at UWA and, and Murdoch. Um, they all asked me the same questions. You know, I'd like to have an international career. How do I get there? Um, I want to get into DFAT. How do I get into DFAT? What are the most important uh, subjects that I should study if I want a career in international affairs? Um, what else do I need to do? You know, they, they were asking me all the same questions. So I thought, well, I'll write a book about that because I thought if I write a book, it'll answer all their questions and they can see exactly from my experience how I did it. That doesn't mean to say it's going to be the same way that other people do it, but that's, but that's, my, that's my story. Um, and uh, people, I say, people say, what, what should I study? What's the best thing? And I say, um, it doesn't matter actually what you study. What's important is that you get very good marks in it, which means you've got to do something that you really love so that you do get good marks because that's the, that's the first step, particularly in getting into foreign affairs because it's extremely competitive. So the first thing they look at is what your marks are, what your academic background is. And then they look at all the other things about you. And you should also have a lot of other things about you. You shouldn't be doing things that are just study. And, um, and I, I'd say, you know, you really, there isn't a, a plan for your life. Life is what happens when you're actually thinking about you're doing something else. And in my case, I mean, I was at university. I'd done my first degree. I was doing a dip ed. I was working part-time as a journalist. And uh, I thought that, that I was going to be a journalist or I was going to be a teacher. I didn't think for one minute that I was going to be a diplomat. For one thing, I was a new migrant in Australia. Um, I'd only been in Australia for four years. I regarded myself as English. I didn't regard myself uh, as Australian. And so I didn't, I didn't even, even think about it. And then uh, in that last year at university, a friend of mine uh, who was, had also had an English background 
um, bumped into me at uni and said, you know, I'm really excited. I've been accepted by a DFAT provisionally on passing my exams. And I said, what? You, but you're but you're but you're not Australian. He said, "Oh, it doesn't matter. You know, they take it, it, people like us that you have that were English, um, and uh, you know." So, so I thought to myself, frankly, I'm brighter than you are. I think you're going to fail your exams, but I'm, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> so if they if they'll take you, they'll they probably should take me. So I thought that for that moment. So then I thought, oh well, that's quite a good idea. So I went along to the careers office. Said, when the foreign affairs people are here. I'd like to like to talk to them. And they said they'd been and applications closed today for foreign affairs. So, but they said, if you send a telegram saying you want to apply and then send your documentation in the next few days, uh, that'll be, that'll be work, that'll work. And that's, and that's what happened. So it wasn't a long-term plan. I didn't study things with a view to going to foreign affairs. That's just the way things worked out. But as it turned out, as I sort of explain in the book, really a lot of things that happened in my life along the way, which sort of pointed towards a career in international relations. Um, I was, uh, I'd lived in a lot of overseas countries. I had good cross-cultural skills. I could speak foreign languages. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, my, I had family people who had been involved in government along the way, so I knew a bit about that. Uh, my father was in the army. We moved around because of that, and uh, there was a strong sense of duty in being a, an army person, so I had that. So a lot of things happened along the way, but that's actually how I got there. It was absolute happenstance. It wasn't a long-term a long -term plan in the slightest, slightest thing, <laughs> in the slightest way. So what else did you ask me? My life oh. lessons, life lessons along the way. Well, lots, lots of life lessons. Some of them I've, I've touched, on, touched on already, um, but I think in terms of a career in diplomacy, the, the first thing that I, I learned and I knew very well is every deal is done by one person with another person. You know, things don't happen without human intervention. It's humans who make things happen. And so the important thing is really having the skills which leads, leave, leaves you open to making relationships with other people, to learning what makes them tick, to learning how to have a discussion with them how, if you're trying to do a deal, how to find out what they want in the deal as well as what you want in the deal, and to really have a very wide range of interests and connections uh, and, and an interest in people. I think that was the first thing. I think people who, who were the sort of nerds who don't want to do anything but sit behind a computer are not the sort of people that are good in diplomacy. Thanks, Sue. Um, now, you start off your book with uh, a wonderful um, little prologue, and uh, you actually describe uh, a situation uh, in which you were called in uh, to speak directly with the Prime Minister, who was Gough Whitlam at the time. Um, you were a junior diplomat. You just returned from your first posting in Lisbon, Portugal. Can you tell us uh, the three questions that the Prime Minister asked you and why you chose to start your book uh, by recounting that anecdote and those three questions. Absolutely, I'm happy to do that. Yes, I came back from Portugal um, and got back to work in the department the day the revolution happened in Portugal, uh, what was called the Carnation Revolution. And, um, <coughs> and the Prime Minister, as you say, Gough Whitlam, asked the department to send someone over to brief him on what was all that about. And he said, and I don't want some old person who just doesn't know what's going on. I want someone who really knows. And as I just got back to work that day, they came to me and said, Sue, go and, talk, go and talk to the prime minister. He wants to be briefed on what's happened in Portugal. Well, I was a bit nervous about this because I was very young. I was uh, just back from my, from my, from my first posting, and, which was Portugal. But uh, you know, off I went, in the, old, the old parliament house. So I tripped off through the Rose Garden in my high heels and sort of making sure that my hair was all right and that my lipstick was okay and you know that I was all set to go and got into Parliament House and um, so they showed me into the Prime Minister's office and the first things he said to me was Sue he said tell me what's going on in Portugal and what does it mean for Australia and what should we do about it so those were the those were the three questions and I chose to start the book with that because I think that those are the underlying principles 
which um, go underneath what diplomacy is about, what the department is about, what we're, what we're doing. Working internationally, we want to know what's going on in the country that we're working in. We want to know if, there's, if, they, if it affects Australia's interests in any way. And if it does Australia's, affect Australia's interests, what we need to do about it. How can we capitalize it or how can we head it off, whichever, whichever way you want to look at that. But basically, those are, the, those are the three principles that underline the work of every diplomatic mission. And I'm really pleased to say that Michelle Chan, who's working in the Prime Minister's office at the moment and worked for me at one stage, she said those, that those three, that injunction is so important that she thinks that everybody going to serve Australia overseas ought to have that tattooed somewhere on their body. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we won't uh, encourage any unhealthy practices, Sue. Um, uh, now, Sue, um, yours has been a remarkable career. Um, uh, so, some absolutely fantastic postings, as, as Jenny mentioned, uh, you were posted at the UN in New York, uh, you were High Commissioner in, in Fiji, uh, you were Ambassador in Vietnam, but the, the, the really remarkable thing about your career, I think, is uh, the fact that you um, were one of few women, as Jenny said, to really blaze a trail and, uh, and make sure that uh, you were able to advance and to prosper in a highly patriot pa patriarchic uh, system. Uh, and uh, even though uh, things in surrounding society have got better over time, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the barriers uh, that you came across and some of the ways that you, you come some of those barriers uh, to a woman making her way in a very male-dominated world. It was a male-dominated world. I mean, when the day we joined DFAT, I was astounded to learn that we women, we were only two women in a class of 23 when we were recruited, two of us were women, and we discovered that we were being paid 10% less than our male colleagues for doing exactly the same work because equal pay for equal work was, was not in at that time. The government had mandated that the public service should pay, pay equal pay, but it was being staged in over two years. So for the first couple of years, we were being paid 10, 10% less than our male colleagues. That's the first thing. But basically, the, the whole atmosphere was very male. Um, foreign affairs was a very male domain. Um, absolutely, men, men were in all the positions of authority and all the important positions. Um, and they were all supported by sort of very loyal and selfless women who kept the home, home fires burning and at overseas posts were indefatigable ambassadors' wives. Um, they, they, a lot of the women behind the scenes were doing things, but the men all had that support and they were really not used to having women working with them. So to begin with, they were very nice and they were um, very sweet and uh, thought that we were rather lovely and you know it was quite nice having us around but you know but as to be taken seriously well that was another thing altogether i mean when i was going off on my first post which was portugal as you said the secretary of the department um had we all had an interview with the secretary before we went on our postings and he said oh sue it's terrific that you're going to portugal you'll love it very interesting history um lovely architecture very good food and wine and I'm sure you'll have a lovely time. So I said, well, that's terrific, Secretary. But I said, what about the work? And he said, don't you worry your pretty little head about that. Can you, can you believe it? That's what he said to me. You know, I was, there was this high overachieving alpha female you know, off on her first post about to take on the world. And I was told not to worry my pretty little head about it. So I mean, that's the sort of, sort of thing that happened. So we were constantly fighting and struggling to maintain a position, but doing it nicely. I mean, it seemed to me mostly that it was the easiest way to, to be nice to people and encourage the blokes to support us and not, not put them down much. You know, we tried to, to sort of work with them, build, build good relations with them. But you know, then when you started to see why there were so few women in senior positions in foreign affairs, um, we had a good look at the history of what had happened with women's careers and men's careers. And we found that really the, the men were being very nice to the women. You know, they were saying, we'll, we'll send you off to nice posts 
where as girls, you'll be all right and nothing will happen to you. So we can send you to places like Paris and we can send you to places like London, but there's no thought of sending us to places like Tokyo or Jakarta or Beijing or anywhere that actually mattered in Australian foreign policy terms. And those posts, those so-called um, non-hardship posts were three years in duration, whereas the hardship posts, those other posts that I've mentioned, which mattered, they were only two years. So in a 10 year period, the blokes had built up a much better portfolio of claims for promotion than the women had. So those are sort of things that we identified and that had to be changed. And the whole question of um, it, it, women who were married, what you did about their spouses, if they had children, how you accommodated them at a post, uh, all those things had to, because all those things were barriers to women, women, women's advancement. So we put a lot of work into addressing those questions. And in due course, government came around to thinking that that was right. And so the department was mandated to put in those sort of reforms. I mean, we never had a, we never had a promotion, proper promotion committee before, you know? I mean, the blokes, whoever they were, sat around and decided who should be promoted, on, on what grounds, who knew, uh, that we weren't interviewed. And in fact, there was a file which they used to consult called the X-Files, which had all the scuttlebutt about us in it, it apart from our official files. And they had all sorts of crap in there, which was absolute, absolute nonsense. You know, I mean, I, for example, when I got access to my X-File, I discovered that the, 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 the group of three men who had interviewed us and appointed, appointed me had said that I was uh, attractive and well-groomed, but nonetheless intelligent. <laughs> As if they were mutually exclusive. Well, this is right. But that's the sort of thing that we were up against. And then there were a few straight out sort of sexist stuff that was going on that you that you had to you had to had to knock back. One story which I like to tell is about when I was posted at the UN in New York. And we had the upcoming second special session of the United Nations on disarmament coming up. And I was looking after disarmament at the UN and, and other, other, other things. And I was the Australian delegate in this committee. And the, the chair of the preparatory committee was an Indian diplomat called um, Ambassador Venkateshwaran, who we used, everybody used to call him Venkat, you know? So at the end of each day's work, he'd say, well, gentlemen, I think that concludes our work for the day. I declare the meeting closed. So I was, I was you know, bubbling along with, with crossness inside of this, of this sexist language. So on the third day, I asked to take the floor and said, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, yes. Um, he said, I said, um, I, 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 I have to tell you that we women delegates are feeling very tired because we've been in continuous session for three days. You've closed off the meeting for the gentlemen every day, but you haven't closed off the meeting for us. Would you mind closing off the meeting for all of us? And he said, oh, I apologize to the most beautiful, most charming, lovely lady delegate of Australia. He said, but when I was at school, we were taught that man embraces woman unless otherwise specified. And I said, quick as a flash, I'm quite pleased about this. I said to him, well, sir, I'm sure your teachers also told you that gentlemen do not embrace, embrace ladies unless specifically invited. <laughs> <laughs> so we got through that one. But you had to you know, use all those devices to sort of clear the way and make it, make it an equal playing field. Uh, so two of the other um, devices or or, uh, or or strategies you used. Uh, one was uh, playing sport. Golf was something that you used uh, to to cross barriers. And another one was uh, your interest in art. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the importance of sport and art in diplomacy? Yes. Well, indeed, I did. I did find them when I was. I was always quite sporty. But when I was posted to Bangladesh. Um, the first thing the business community asked me was, do you, play go do, you, do you play golf? And I said, well, no, I don't. And they said, well, we really think you need to play golf here because everybody in Bangladesh who matters, everybody who makes decisions are all golfers. So the deals are done on the golf course. So you need to be, be a golfer. So I thought, well, I'm interested in golf. I'd like to learn. So I'm happy to get there. And so well, one, of the, one of the business people uh, got a colleague to bring a set of golf clubs and shoes and gloves and stuff up from Australia to, to, to Dhaka because there was no pro shop at the golf, golf course. You had to bring in all your equipment. And so they brought in the equipment for me and then took me along to the, 
to the, the caddy master, because we didn't have a pro there, and said, tell the caddy master that the, the high commissioner wants to learn to play golf. Her Excellency wants to play golf, Her Excellency. So who have you got who can teach her? So he chose the, the best uh, golfer amongst the caddies, and he became my permanent caddy and coach. And so he taught me how to, how to play golf. And very, I mean, I was quite sporty, and I, so I quickly learned how to do it, and I was quite good at it, which was lucky. Um, because then, of course, uh, people would invite me to play with them. Um, yeah, everybody wanted to play with the Australian High Commissioner, and they didn't care if you were a man or a woman, you know, you were the High Commissioner. And so I got to meet everybody um, on the golf course, uh, including the president and all the ministers and uh, other ambassadors. And it was a real door opener for me. And subsequently, in other posts, golf has also been a very, very useful tool. And I found it useful in Fiji and absolutely useful in Hong Kong for all the same reasons. Art, similarly, I was really interested in art. And when I got to each country, I was interested in learning about the art of the country, meeting the artists, um, finding what their arts were about, what it revealed about their culture and their background, and a really another way of getting to know the country. And also I discovered it was a good way of, uh, it was a diplomatic tool. I could link artists in Australia with artists in that country. There could be art collaborations um, in painting, in dancing, uh, in literature. And all those were made ways of making links between Australia and the country where I was posted. So those, uh, those sort of things, tools, I found really invaluable in my career. Thanks, Sue. Now, Sue, um, the, uh, your, your career could be described as being in two halves. The first half of your career saw postings in Europe, in North America. Um, when you came back uh, at the end of the 1980s from New York, uh, you spent some time working in the department and, and particularly closely with Gareth Evans. Uh, but all of your latter postings were Asia Pacific postings. So I want you to talk a little bit about uh, Australia's Asia Pacific agenda um, under the two foreign ministers with whom you worked most closely, Gareth Evans and Alexander Downer, and uh, talk about what Australia was trying to achieve in Asia and what its senior diplomats like yourself, what part they played in the, in the grand design of, uh, of Australia's foreign policy in the Asia Pacific. Well, that's a very broad question. I mean, I think Australia's ob objectives in the country, the countries that I served in, certainly, um, was that there should be peace and tranquility in those countries, so that they could prosper, so that um, trade could take place, that uh, people could be educated, that women could be advanced, that women could be used, in fact, as the main medium for uh, civilizing, civilizing each the, the, the countries that they were in. I mean, the women are the most important part of any, if any society, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. So enhancing their roles, um, but basically to create and ensure that the world, world stayed stable, that it was a good place to trade with, that it, there weren't any um, uh, security threats emanating from those countries, um, that it's really Australia's interests were served by what was happening in those countries and to build the relationships with those countries, really with those objectives in, those objectives in mind. So when I went to Fiji, for example, um, I, I was bored in Hong Kong. There was nothing interesting for me to do in Hong Kong. It was after handover and everybody else in my mission were busy doing useful things, but actually it was nothing for the head of mission to do. And so I asked to leave and uh, they rang me up and said, we think there's going to be a coup in Fiji and we think you're the right sort of person to handle things in, in the case of a coup. So we'd like you to move to Fiji, please. But all the, all the Hong Kong people thought I was mad. Hong Kong was the center of the universe. What was I doing going off to this holiday destination? You know, they didn't realize that for Australia, the Pacific is really important, much more important, in fact, in those days than Hong Kong was. Couldn't say that to them. And so I got there and the coup did happen. And so that my job was, um, very clearly defined for that those for those first months in trying to assist the people in Fiji who wanted to bring the situation back to normal and that Australians would be protected and Australia's interests trade interests would be protected a lot of Australians live and work in Fiji that they would all be safe 
um, to make, make to help all those things to happen. And we actually worked very hard, get the hostages who'd been the hostages who'd been uh, in, incarcerated in Parliament House during that coup, the spate coup, you know, work uh, to, to make sure they were protected and to work to, with all the people in Fiji who were the people working themselves to try and bring the situation back to normality. Mm -hmm. So I worked very hard in, in, in those days and was very proud that in the end, we got the situation back to normality. And at the end of my posting, um, the prime minister um, said, he said, Sue, I have to tell you, we were very grateful to Australia for all that you've done to help us. And we're particularly grateful to you personally, because we know your personal role that you've played in this situation. And as uh, the Prime Minister UK gave me a lot of very useful advice in our various meetings, and I always followed your advice. So I want to thank you very much for that. So at the end of that posting, I felt, well, that was good. I'd done what I was supposed to, to do, and the situation was fine. It wasn't perfect, of course, as we saw, because there was another coup after that, Bani Marama's coup, which I wasn't there for. Um, but you know, those are the sort of things that we were doing. So in each country, there was a, 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 what he actually did was different because what was happening in each country was different. different. I mean, in Bangladesh, it was mostly about um, aid and managing floods and that sort of stuff. Um, it wasn't the, the sort of political stuff that we had in, in Fiji, but in each of those countries, that those were the sort of frameworks we, we were working in. And there were a variety of tools at our disposal. And in each case, you had to work very closely with the minister because in those fast moving situations, you needed Australia to be able to react appropriately and quickly. And to do that, you had to have good relation with the minister so that th those messages got through and the levers of power could be pulled in in Australia to make, to make things happen. So I, was, I had, as you said, a very good relationship with Gareth. I actually worked with him um, every day, preparing him for question time in parliament. And we got on, we got on very well together. We, I, I could be as rude to him as he was being rude to me, and it was all right. I got away with it, um, and we had a we had a very good relationship. And uh, and then with Downer, we had a, a contretemps, um, which I just described in the book, um, over the question of the Mitwan Bridge in Vietnam. But having got that bit of unpleasantness out of the way, we actually worked together very well for the rest of my career. And he he was the one who posted me to Hong Kong. Hong Kong and posted me to Fiji. So um, that, that all worked. Is that the sort of information you were looking for? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Sue. Now, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to go to audience questions. And can I ask people in the audience to please type your questions into uh, the chat uh, function? And we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. And Sue has very kindly agreed to uh, to answer any others that we don't get to for Asia Link Insights uh, at, a, at a short time after this session. So, <laughs> so let me uh, turn then to uh, the current, uh, you know, our, our current foreign policy situation and our current foreign policy challenges. What do you see as um, the biggest challenges to Australian foreign policy, particularly in the Asia Pacific, um, and uh, what, from your long diplomatic and foreign policy career, uh, what advice would you give uh, to our current di diplomats about managing some of these challenges? Yes, well, of course, it's a, it's a fast moving uh, situation that we're dealing with in, in the area. The main challenge, of course, is China and how we deal with the, China's new perception of itself and its position in the world and what it's trying to achieve and how that impacts on our bilateral interests and uh, how, we, how we work with that. And I think that that's a, a long-term work in, work in progress. Um, I'd like to think that there are people like you and me on the ground working in the embassy and being able to talk to people quietly and find out what's going on and sort of guide what the, the steps forward ought to be rather than people stand, standing up in Canberra with megaphones and megaplo megaphone diplomacy, which I think is not going to achieve our objectives. So uh, certainly that. Now, of course, I mean, we've now got the challenge of Afghanistan, which is a new, a new challenge on our board. We've already had the immediate challenge of how to evacuate all those people who deserve protection and the, the on the ground challenge of doing that. And it's been amazing to see 
how Australia and the other countries have managed to rally and get aircraft in there and take so many people out and to reach a deal with the Taliban um, to do that. But that deal, of course, is going to expire. And what happens next? And what happens in Afghanistan? I mean, who becomes the government? Who do you deal with? What are the challenges that they've got to face? Is there any role for Australia in that? How do we best help? Um, how do we try and ensure the status of women is protected? How do we, how do we work on that? How, uh, what happens in, the, in uh, Afghanistan's economy? Um, how do, how, do we have a role to play in that? Because certainly there are other people circling Afghanistan who think they've got a role in controlling that. And what will that mean for us? So I think there are a lot of challenges for us every day now and uh, for the people in foreign affairs and the other other agencies at the moment i think there are ma major challenges and interesting interesting ways to to lead your life if dealing with those indeed thank you sue now uh we've got a question that's just come in uh i'm going to read it out directly hi sue were there any foreign policies or australian stances regarding the country uh you were posted to that you disagreed with if so, how did you reconcile your personal political beliefs and your role as an Australian diplomatic representative? Yes, that's a very good question. There was one outstanding uh, policy by the Australian government with which I disagreed fundamentally and I was expected to play a role in, and that was the Pacific solution. Um, the way the Howard government uh, decided that we would deal with uh, boat people and people seeking a refugee status in Australia. Uh, and as part of that, there was a search for other places in the, because the decision was of course, not to not would deal with any of those people on Australian territory, not, so not to give them any inside running in, in achieving their objectives. And to do that, we're going to, to set, off, set up uh, processing areas in the Pacific states. And to, to, so my, my job, my instruction was to talk to the governments of the countries to which I was accredited and I had Fiji and I had Tuvalu and I had Nauru uh, as my countries of accreditation uh, and to, um, to, to, to try uh, ask whether they would, they would work with us uh, to set up processing centres. So I first of all asked the government of Fiji and Fiji was just coming out of its own coup uh, and the aftermath of that, not terribly anxious to do, do something like this, didn't want to say no to Australia. So very cleverly said, well, I think this is a matter for parliament. I think we'll refer it to parliament to talk and think about it. And then I'll come back and give you your answer. And then parliament will said, well, we we'll set up a special committee to look at this request and then we'll, we'll come back to you on it later. So they didn't say no, but they managed to avoid saying anything for a bit. So we knew what they meant. Tuvalu said, Sue, you've got to be joking. We're a minuscule island with a small amount of, of land and we're facing uh, challenges from, the, from climate change. The sea levels are rising. We're losing our land. We've got little enough land as it is. And you want us to dedicate some of that to handling refugees for Australia? You've got to be joking. Quite straightforward. Not going to do it, you know, quite straightforward. So I thought, well, that's, that's fair enough. I understand that. Uh, and uh, so I... But per, my personal view was that this was a very bad policy. I did not agree with this policy. I did not want to implement this policy. I wanted no part in doing what the government was asking me to do. So what was I to do? And I just discussed it with my staff and we, just, we decided, well, this was a policy which even though we didn't like it, our government was a legitimate government. It had the right to make this policy, even if we didn't agree with it. And it certainly had the support of the Australian public, if you could understand what the opinion polls were saying. So it was clearly well supported by a lot of people in Australia. So there was no, so under that, as an ambassador, you have a duty to implement a policy that your government has, has, put, has put in. You, I had to do what they're asking me to do. If I didn't want to do it, I could have resigned, but that wouldn't have been any good because somebody else would have done it. It would still have happened. So I decided the best way to do it, to handle this, was to do what I was being asked to do, but to try and do it in a way that minimized the damage to Australia's interest in the long run, to, to do that using my skills to, to do that. Then of course, we got to the question of Nauru. And um, so we had the, the Pacific Islands Forum was taking place in Nauru and the leader of the Australian delegation 
um, was an uh, Australian minister, and he put it to the head of Nauru about how, how about helping us. And, and Nauru thought it was, this was a terrific idea. Nauru was bankrupt. Its, its desalinator was out of order. It had no fresh water. Um, it was not getting any supplies to its shops because it hadn't paid the suppliers in Australia for some time because they'd been had no money to pay them. Public servants hadn't been paid for six months. Um, they were triple bankrupt. All their investments had gone sour. And so <coughs> the idea that Australia would want to put a, a, a processing centre on Nauru was great, provided we paid for it. And they, they so they screwed Australia for every cent that they could. Well, we need to have the desalinator fixed. Will you pay for someone to come from Australia? Yes, of course. We haven't paid our public servants for six months. Will you pay the public servants? Yes, of course. Uh, we've got all, all these medical bills in, in Brisbane because all our sick people have gone to Brisbane hospitals and we've got all their medical bills. Will you pay all those bills, Australia? Yes, of course we will. So so that's that's how it, that's how it was done. Um, and, and as we know, the, the saga still runs on. It's not, it's not been solved at all. Um, but so that was, that was a really difficult issue for me to manage. So um, thank you for that. Um, another question about a, um, a country you were ambassador in, Vietnam. Uh, one of the questions observes that American Vice President Kamala Harris uh, is visiting uh, Vietnam today. Um, uh, the questioner asks, what do you expect to be the outcome? Um, can you describe uh, the nature of uh, the US relationship with Vietnam? What might Kamala Harris be wanting to achieve? And what might the, Vietnam, what, what might the Vietnamese agree to or not? Well, uh, there we go. There's a lot of questions there. I mean, first of all, it's a good idea that she's there. Um, America has been a bit slow, actually, in putting a practical footprint on the ground in our area of interest. I mean, um, but particularly, you know, they sort of say they're interested, and of course, but you know, actually being there is, is another thing altogether. So it's in our interest that America shows its shows its its presence more in the in the district, and that's good that she's done that. Vietnam is a remarkable partner for us, and Vietnam has grown. Its, uh, its economy fantastically. It's come from the state of when it was a war uh, and not a country to, to, to what, where it is now. It's managed that extraordinarily well. Its economy has grown. Um, the status of women is, uh, is honored. Um, it's, it's, it's really a modern miracle what, what, what the Vietnamese people has, have achieved. So for us, they're a very good trading partner. They're a very good um, strategic ally. Um, we have agreements with Vietnam, which are, are useful agreements for Australia. And, um, and the Americans are doing the same, which is quite different from when I was first posted there. Because when I was posted there, the Americans were not there at all. Um, they, they were still thinking in MIA, MIA terms. They thought that there were prisoners from the Vietnam War that were still being held and not being revealed. Um, there was no American ambassador there because uh, Vietnam was being boycotted. There was no, no American business there, which was great for Australia because we were there and we creamed it. We, we, took, we, we took advantage of all those things which made were good for Australia at the time. It was a terrific opportunity for us, but it wasn't going to last long. America sent an ambassador and things started to normalise. So I, that's what I think. I think that she will be talking in practical terms about ways in which the countries can work to work together. Vietnam will be really pleased to have this um, show from America. It'll be, that's a positive thing to do. And I think there are lots of areas in which Australia, uh, America can, can contribute to Vietnam in the same way that Australia did. Um, and having them there as well will be a very good thing. Thanks, Sue. Um, another question relates to another of your postings, that of, uh, Consul General in Hong Kong. Uh, the question asks, uh, what is your perspective on the ramifications of the national security law on Hong Kong civil society? Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. It, it, it is going to have an impact. There's no doubt about it. The nature of civil society in Hong Kong is going to change and is changing um, because of the moves that uh, Beijing has made and because of the changing uh, status of Hong Kong. Um, with it within China, if you like, and vis-a-vis -vis the outside world. It's not going to be the way that it used to be, and that's been made very clear. Um, and so I think there are major changes in place. In terms of Australia's interests, 
Um, we obviously watch the situation very closely. Um, it's in ec economic terms important to Australia. There are a lot of dual nationals, um, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, uh, and Australian citizens. Um, you know, when there's an election in Australia, Hong Kong is the second largest polling station in the world um, because of the number of uh, citizens who live in Hong Kong and come along to vote. It's very interesting. The largest polling station is Australian, Australia House in London, but the second largest is, is ours uh, in Hong Kong. So um, there's going to be changes and what, what, how it's going to end up, I don't know. Um, Hong Kong people are pretty resilient and uh, so you hope that they'll find a, find a way through it. It's not in anybody's interest really that the situation uh, deteriorates. Mm. Absolutely. Very sad indeed. Mm. Uh, so um, there's a bit of a day in the life question. Can you run down of what a day in the life of an ambassador uh, looked like? Um, uh, <laughs> you know, how, how did it all how did it all transpire? Well, I in, in Fiji during the, the aftermath of the coup. Um, and trying to find a solution, I would wake up every morning thinking, who do I have to influence today? You know, what, what, what was out there for us? And so days are sometimes quite unpredictable. I had bodyguards when I was in Fiji. And um, so they had to go places with me and look after me. And uh, there, there were days when I didn't go anywhere, that all my work was actually in the office, uh, dealing with emails, dealing with consular matters, you know, looking after problems with the aid program, I mean, a whole, whole raft of things that you might have to turn your mind to. But I sort of felt I had to leave the office so that they could come with me. Just a bit like having dogs, you know, you have to take the dogs for a walk every day. You can't just have them sitting or sitting around under your feet, you know. So I, I had to sort of make things to do to keep, to keep them occupied. And they were terrific, terrific, terrific uh, federal policemen who looked after me. So it varies from place to place and day to day and week to week. Um, if you're a single ambassador without a, I must, I, I always said that I really need a wife, you know, I don't need a husband, but I needed um, someone, and it's an awful thing to say because the husbands these days do these things, you know, what, that you want them to do. But, you know, I had to look after my household uh, as well as look after the mission. And uh, so to decide who we were having to dinner and what we were going to eat and what the staff needed and what food we needed to order and stuff, you know, I had to look after all that, my, my base, as well as the embassy. So there's a range of things and no one day is predictable. And you might have a diary which says you're going to do this, this and this, and then something else comes up completely and you're, and you're not going to do that. You're going to do something else. So you have to be resourceful. You have to be adaptable. You have to be ready to turn your hand to a lot of different things. I actually think it's terrific fun. I enjoyed that. Um, it suited my temperament and, uh, and it, it, was, it was good fun. And a lot of interesting things happened. I mean, for example, <laughs> Uh, during uh, back to Fiji, the um, president's um, private secretary came to see me during well the crisis was on to tell me what was happening with the president and what the plans were for what to do about the president uh, to keep us informed. And um, then, then I was a bit nervous about him because he's a nice chap. And I said, Joe, I said, this is a dangerous time here in Fiji. I'm a bit worried. Are you looking after your own security? And he said, yes, Sue, I look after my own security with the thing I carry with me all the time. I said, what do you mean? He said, and he opened his jacket and he said, like this gun. So he took out a handgun, which he had under his jacket. <laughs> so I was a bit surprised, really. But then as I was showing him out, my secretary gave him back his mobile phone because she'd taken his mobile phone off him. That was our policy. We didn't let people take mobile phones into the ambassador's office. And uh, I said, Wendy, I said, you took his mobile phone away. Did, did, you, did you also know he was carrying a gun? She said, well, yes, I did. He told me that. He said, but I knew what our policy was on phones. I didn't know what our policy was on guns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so we're, we're running out of time, but there's a couple of really fascinating gender-based questions here, and I'm going to try and sort of fold them into uh, a, a one question for you. Um, is there a particular um, kind of feminine way of foreign policy and diplomacy? Are there certain advantages that women have as diplomats that men don't have? And has that, trans has that increase in the number of women 
in the Australian Foreign Service uh, 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 resulted in a better foreign policy performance by Australia? Well, I I do think so. In my in my experience um, in, in in foreign affairs and in the, the countries I was accredited to posted in, I never found any barrier um, being a woman. I was treated uh, perfectly well and for perfectly properly. Properly, in fact, in a country like Bangladesh, for example, which you know is a Muslim society, and there are ways that women things women have to do and things men have to do. Um, for example, at a wedding, you know, big big events, weddings. There were always two tents, two shamianas, one for the women and one for the men. And so I, but as, a, as a woman ambassador, I could go to both tents. I was welcome in the men's tent because I was ambassador and I was welcome in the women's tent because I was a woman. So I had access to a much wider range of society than my male colleagues did in Bangladesh. So it was a positive advantage um, in, in that case. And uh, that was my experience professionally. Once we got away from Canberra and all those blokes who were sort of holding us back at the beginning, you know. So is there a feminine? That, yes, women, women do things differently. Women have access to other women in ways that men don't have access to other women in countries where the women are important in decision making, in cultures and societies where the women quietly work behind the scenes to do things, but the blokes are in the front. Um, women, I think, have great advantages, and I think women are uh, women are a sort of kind and caring people on the whole, and I think that translates into a different approach to the way you work with people in other countries, uh, and I think it opens up more more opportunities for you. Um, that's not to say that there aren't men who also have those characteristics and are able able also to work effectively. But if all of you are able to work effectively, then, then that's, that's obviously good for Australia. And I'm delighted to see now the increase in the number of women ambassadors. When I first went out as an ambassador, there were just four of us, four women ambassadors in the whole foreign service. Now, uh, there's something like 43% of, uh, of heads of mission, Australian heads of mission are women. So there's, and we've had Frances Adamson as head of the department. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been really, there've been fantastic changes uh, which I welcome, but there are still blocks and there are still things that need fixing and there are still blokes that are un unreconstructed, but, you know, we need to work on them. So your um, Margaret Toomey, who was your deputy in Fiji, mm -hmm. uh, who was posted as ambassador to Russia, said that uh, Vladimir Putin didn't quite know how to handle her because she was a, a, a woman. Do you think at times um, one of the advantages for a woman diplomat is that your male interlocutors are less inclined to be to act aggressively and um, uh, you know in, in a very kind of testosterone filled way as they would with a man? I think that's true. I think that is true. These cultural constraints um, are around us all the time and in different countries they operate in different ways but no I, I yes I think that's right. I think that it does open open doors for you. I've never been in a situation though where they don't don't know quite what to do with me because I mean I'm quite straightforward about getting it be known what 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 I expect and and when when people behave badly towards me um, and not 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 foreigners really but Australians then I'm as likely to to tell them that I'm you know I'm not happy with the, with, with the way they're treating me. Um, and on the whole, that's worked. Um, but no, I don't. I, 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 I'm surprised that uh, Margaret had that uh, problem with Putin, but I'm sure she sorted him out. I mean, she was very good. <laughs> She's a wonderful deputy. <laughs> <laughs> She's got some wonderful Putin stories. Um, uh, look, uh, Sue, so, uh, we've pretty much come to the end of, of, of the questions. Um, I just want to thank you again. It's been a, an absolutely fascinating conversation. Mm -hmm. I would love to keep asking you questions, but I'm getting the wrap up um, uh, signals from our uh, from from our uh, staff here. So I'm going to hand across to Jenny. Jenny, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Sue. What an absolutely fabulous hour it's been. It's gone like five minutes. Um, an extraordinary career that you've had, as as Michael said, a remarkable career and one where you continue to be such an ongoing source of wisdom and counsel in so many ways. And this, the book is, is a very important one. 
and your advice, your willingness to advise younger people wanting to get new new people coming, wanting to get into this extraordinary field that you've had the great joy and privilege of, of having throughout your life, a career in the foreign service. I, I suppose I wanted to say to many of our students listening that um, only a, a relatively small number, in fact, a very small number of people get to be ambassador or head of mission, but there are lots of other great jobs in international relations. And uh, as Sue said, it is very difficult to get accepted into foreign affairs, but there are many other jobs these days that will give you that opportunity. Um, and so don't don't be too put off, do, do go for it. I think, um, Sue, you've also incredibly generously said that you will answer other questions and uh, that would be great. We'd love to have some more from you in insights. It's, a, it's an absolute joy. Um, I think that the other thing I wanted to maybe su to suggest, uh, particularly to some of the women watching, is to uh, also have a look at the program on ABC TV Misrepresented with Annabelle Crabb and you'll see also some of the challenges that women have faced in our parliament, but also you'll see, as Sue has said, what a big change we've seen over the last 30, well, probably the last decade really it's been, hasn't it, where we've really seen that significant increase in women in senior positions and women in parliament. And it is making, I think, a very significant difference to uh, the way we manage our international relations and the way we manage our community. So thank you, please, everybody. I want to thank a, a terrific audience, some fantastic questions, and uh, thank you for your attention. And I want to say that the book is um, it has been it's now in its fourth reprint. So do go get your copy of Sue's book, and you're in for an absolute treat. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much, Sue, and thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>